Welcome to the Deal Machine Real Estate Investing Podcast, where we help ambitious W-2 employees who want to leave their job in the next 12 months, earn a million dollars per year, drive their dream car, pursue their passions, and take control of their life. We'll actually teach you by interviewing people who have replaced their W-2 income through the proven business model of wholesaling real estate, a way to earn big checks by finding discounted real estate and passing it off to an investor who has money and can give you a $25,000 finder's fee for finding the deal. We're going to give you two weekly interviews plus one expert-led masterclass in front of a live Q&A audience of the Deal Machine community, people who are trying to get this journey done themselves. My co-host is Ryan Haywood, whose sales job was cut when his commissions were cut in 2019, so he quit. And his wife was pregnant at the time, so he actually took a 14-day wholesaling challenge and made 8500 bucks and has gone on to do 400 deals since then in St. Joseph, Missouri. I'm David Lecco, and I created a process for finding off-market deals that has helped people close 10,000 deals in all 50 states, which turned into the software platform Deal Machine. The Deal Machine REI Podcast. Everything you need to know to get started in real estate investing. Hey guys, welcome back to the Deal Machine Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you're in a job you hate, we help you build a life you love through a business model called wholesaling real estate. It doesn't require a lot of cash. And Michael is our guest today. He actually made $100,000 on his very first wholesale deal, a salary that not a lot make in their entire year of working a W-2 job. So I can't wait to dive into this with you guys so you can learn what's possible. If you guys have actually gotten any value from this podcast so far, make sure you're subscribed and leave us a review. It helps us make more content to get you to financial freedom. Michael, you're from New York. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And I'm just dying to know, how did you make $100,000 on your first wholesale deal? So let me explain a few things. First of all, I had been actively investing for for four years before that, and I had money coming in from flips that I had sold. So when I went into wholesaling and marketing direct to sellers for the first time in 2017, I was spending a lot of money on marketing and some of that was on mail. So this deal came from a mailer and um, it was in a very, very high end area. It's Great Neck, New York. It's one of the top school districts in the country. And, uh, you know, there are areas in there where, you know, where your houses can sell for five or $10 million. Oh, wow. And uh, it was a legal two family, which I was so shocked at. Uh, that the- what does that mean? So that means it's legal to it's a duplex. I mean, you call it. Oh, okay. Outside yeah. of New York, they call it a duplex, but it's also rare, right? It's very it's rare to be in a high end area. What I found when I went when I went to actually see the property is that it, there's one little pocket in that fancy city that's not so nice, and this uh, property was in there, um, and the, the seller was not being the seller told me he didn't live there because it was horribly disgusting, and he really did, and he was selling it to me with the tenant on the second unit that I couldn't go see that. But based on the prop on the number that he wanted, I think he wanted five hundred thousand dollars for it. I said this this could be a this could be a deal. So I locked it up at around five hundred, and uh, showed only the one unit. And I think we sold it for a six twenty. I think we got, but but I did have to pay a a buyer's agent on that about twelve thousand dollars. Pay him two percent. So it was a okay great deal. So okay okay okay. So you made a hundred thousand dollars. Let's break down like what wholesaling is for somebody who doesn't even know what that is. Sure. It's um, getting properties under contract for enough of a discount that you can then assign that contract or possibly double close on that contract to a cash buyer who is going to pay you more than you're in contract for and you're going to make the difference. Gotcha. So if you bought a like half a million dollar property... Um, and you had the traditional mortgage, you might have to put down like a hundred thousand yourself, but with wholesaling, you don't have to do that. Right. Cause you, you've got under contract and you don't even close yourself. So what motivated you to start doing wholesaling after you were already in the business doing traditional flips, which are pretty capital intensive. Yes. So, you know, every time you start a business, you, you think that when you get to a certain level of, uh, units or revenue that everything's going to get better. When I was flipping houses, I got to a point where I think I was up to 17 houses. And at that point, I wanted to blow the back of my head off because I was incredibly overwhelmed with all the horrible things that go on here. 
when it comes to dealing with contractors and dealing with building departments, we have a lot of different building departments. So there could be a township and then there's a little incorporated village in there and every every building department's got other things that they that they ask for or that they need. And I was really getting frustrated, right? Because we we had built a business up. I had a partner then where we had, where we were doing a lot of deals and I started losing money on deals, right? I start, you know, materials were going to the wrong place. Contractors were not telling me the truth. I, I, you know, and I, I sick of driving around, checking out that this guy said something was finished and it wasn't. And I spoke to a guy named Brad Chandler. I don't know if you know him from Express Home Buyers. He's in the DC area. Great guy. And at that point, he was sort of trying to sell coaching. And our our numbers were very similar. So I remember his his buys were like in the 300s and so were mine. And our sales were in the 500s about that. We, we, we were on the same part. And, he's, and he he had, now I found out later, it was Robert Wensley, the owner of uh, Investor Lift, had started working for him about six months earlier and had convinced him to stop, to stop. Uh, rehabbing and to start wholesaling. And his business went from where I was, where it's just incredibly difficult to manage all these moving parts on all these uh, all these rehabs to where it was really doing well. And he told me, you got to start wholesaling. And he said, you got to, and he gave me, he really basically gave me a somewhat of a business plan on how to market to it. And what he said made sense because I still, and I know there are some guys who do a lot of rehabs at one time and they really have, you know, a project management team that, that works for them. But from from my from my understanding, it's very very hard to really scale a business that's doing rehabs. Every single rehab is different. What you're doing there is different. You know what? Every house is different, right? The layout is different. The size is different. The problems with the house are different. But it's much easier to scale a wholesaling business, right? You can because it's the same thing. You're just selling contracts. If you have good transaction coordination and you have good marketing and good sales, you know your, your business and and disposition. Your 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 team's all set up. You can. You can do, you know, 50 deals a month if you needed to. So when he said that to me, it really made me think. And I told my partner, I think we should try this. And uh, since then, I, I would I would wholesale every single deal if I could. Wow, that's awesome. So what are the cases where you still haven't wholesaled when you said, if I could? So, so explain a, that. a lot of times I'm buying properties at a price that's too high to wholesale, but at a price where there's enough of a spread that I can wholetail it. So I have a lot of wholetail properties right now. So when it's not, what's the difference? So wholetailing, I define, and that's a made up word, so you can define it any way you want, is uh, where I'm doing zero to very little work. I'm closing on a property, I'm buying it. I am doing zero to very little work and then putting it on the market just and offering it to the to the public. So it only works on properties that are in decent condition, that someone that are mortgage a bowl, someone could get a mortgage. And it and it works if there's enough of a spread. Now, another thing I didn't tell you, another drawback to New York is our closing costs are absurdly high, like ridiculously high. So I usually need about a spread of $100,000 or more to make this work because my closing costs on my buy, my holding costs and my eventual closing costs on the sale can easily be fifty to $60,000. So I had a, 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 a property once where I closed on it and then two days later, I found a buyer for it. So it took that, and they and they got a mortgage really quickly, six weeks. In New York, it also takes forever to get a mortgage. Um, and I did, I made, and it cost me seven, I think, what was the spread? So I bought it for, for I think it was $125,000 spread, but I only ended up making like $70,000 on it or $65,000 on it. But I mean, it's still a great deal. But so I, I prefer to do that, right? And the the way I, the way I look at a lot of these wholesale deals is if it so very often I can pay more for them than any other competitor if there's a competitor involved because I'm not looking at doing a full rehab on it. I, I, so very so almost every property that I look at, I look at typically to wholesale. So I'm looking at the ARV, the after repaired value. I'm looking at what my repair estimates are and sort of in general trying to buy it at around 70% of ARV and I can sell it to a cash buyer for 80% of ARV minus repairs. Um, but I'm also looking at what the as is value, right? So I just I'm 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 in contract to sell something now that really was old. I mean, Wallpaper City, it's in it's in Oceanside, New York. Mm -hmm. Great area, great part of Oceanside, but it's old. And and everybody else who came in there just said, you know, this thing this thing needs $150,000. And yeah. I looked at it and I'm like, if I can buy it at a decent price, I can just put it out on the market $100,000 less than every other house and somebody's going to take it who's going to do the work themselves that kind of thing. And that's and it, and that's that's what happened. So, um, 
I do a lot of whole tailing in that regard. Gotcha. I got a quick question. Just kind of, it's kind of steering away into a different direction, but when you're talking to, to people who have not done their first deal, what marketing strategy do you have them start with? So the, the general plan is to get a list of people well, get a list depending on where you are, right? In New York, it's also harder to get lists because the public data is not very, uh, the public, the municipalities are not very generous with their data. So I usually tell them to buy a list. First, they've got to choose where they want to operate. Then we buy a list. So we look at whatever is, what lists are available in that area. Like I, I operate in El Paso, Texas. I can get tax delinquent lists. I can get code violation lists very easily there. Um, so buy lists so you get up to about 10,000, a number of about 10,000 properties. Uh, skip trace the list so you get phone that's getting phone numbers from the list and then I tell people to start they should uh, they should call the list call and or text the okay. list right because those are in, inexpensive ways to have a, a calling is really better than texting because you have a conversation right and I and I teach my students you want to have as many conversations with sellers as possible right yeah texting yep. is really sort of a combat I right I don't have to I don't Pass. have to have any uh, no negative confrontation somebody tells me to F off I just mm-hmm. you know I DNC do not call them anymore but you, I go, you're going to need to build up your skin because a lot of people are going to tell you to drop dead and want to have those conversations. Yeah, for sure. And especially in New York, you get told that a lot. Um, <laughs> so, Are you saying that even if somebody says drop dead, then they still might do a deal with you? So it's interesting you say that. I, I, probably not, right? Probably not. But I <laughs> think that you, you have to get past this fear of getting told something negative. Yeah. You have to be confident on the phone. So, I mean, I've been told to uh, die in a fire, jump into a pool of piranhas, you know, all these crazy things. Like I does Oh, you get threatened a lot. Yeah, too. come into your office. I'm going to I'm gonna to come to your house. We, say I'm coming to your office. I'm like, I'll it's all the time. I'm sitting right here. You can come anytime. I'm not afraid, but like but but for some of these newer uh students of mine, um they are afraid. They're afraid but they're afraid sure. of this this negative, but they're usually they're more afraid of of a positive response. They're more afraid of well what am I gonna say if somebody actually does want to sell so I work with them right. to make sure that they're confident enough to talk about that. Mm. Um, that. That's crazy, right there. What you just said is they're afraid of somebody saying yes, then they're not. They're not sure what the next step would be. You're right. I, I didn't realize that because I, I was a stockbroker a long time ago, back in like 1992. And when I was a stockbroker, our job was just to dial all day, right? Make 300 dials, 30 connections, 10 pitches. Like it was very, very methodic. And you would see guys taking lunch for five hours because they just couldn't deal with the with the with the rejection. Um, and I assumed that a lot of my students had that, but when I spoke to them, it was more the other way around. It was like, I'm terrified. Someone's going to want to sell their house. This is going to be my one six figure deal. And I'm going to say something wrong to them. And I, I say to them, you, I promise you, you, that won't happen. And let's go role play enough so that you feel comfortable. And I throw different scenarios yeah. at them. I was shocked, but you're right. I, people are, what I found that so, some are, some are just the, te- some are the first one where it's, they're afraid of the rejection, but more of them are afraid of not knowing what to say for a deal that they think they're going to lose because they're not uh, they're not knowledgeable enough. Please open up your podcast app right now and leave us a review and let us know what you thought of this episode. It means so much because the reviews help us get in front of more people. And the more people we can get in front of, the more we can help them achieve financial freedom. And we also get more energy to put more content out like this to help you. So by leaving us a review, it will give you more content to come to help you along in your journey. Thank you so much. In which case, it's helpful to have you there kind of guiding them in what the next step is. Some people don't start with a coach. So some people start by listening to podcasts or watching YouTube videos on what to do next. And like for me, when I, when I did my first deal, it was I had, I had another wholesaler kind of helping me through the steps, um, which was an huge advantage um and i i don't think that i think it's undersold in the idea of you really should if you're doing a deal you've got a commitment get it under contract and then i think we've talked about this so many times ask other people in your network in your area for help on the next steps because they're the one of the biggest hurdles for us was okay we got the deal now i got to find a buyer for the deal well, you could go and find somebody that has buyers. It's mutually beneficial for them to help you find a buyer for that deal. It's going to it's going to help you quickly get through that process that you're already uncomfortable with. Yeah, absolutely. So I, 
what I find with a lot of people that are thinking about getting a coach is they, they, they suffer from some sort of paralysis by analysis. It's really easy. You, everybody here could, I could spend the rest of my life watching videos from wholesalers on the internet, right? I could be oh, for yeah. 50 years. I could watch it. And a lot of them say different yeah. things, right? I say different things than some of them. I disagree with some things I say. I, I agree with them. Most of them are, are, are right. And they're, they're genuinely trying to help. It's just what their experience has been. So with, with a lot of my students, I tell them, I'll, I'll even go on this seller appointment on a live appointment with them if they want, or I'll get on the phone if it's a virtual, uh, situation. And, you know, some of my students continue to, to join venture deals with me all the time. They, they want me to put up the money. Some of my students are completely independent, never, never did a deal with me. There's no, there's no requirement with my coaching, but what you're saying is absolutely true. Get, getting in touch with somebody who you believe is going to help you is a huge step to, to doing your first deal. It's only temporary right. too. It's not like you're being codependent on somebody else. It's it's until you get the proof of concept and until you have a list of buyers that are going to trust you to continue to do business with you. And maybe this is an option for you if you don't want to deal with the disposition to partner with somebody that will. Maybe you're the one thing that you're really good at is acquisitions. I personally I love acquisitions. I love dispositions too. I love the wholesale process, but maybe you're really good at finding a deal and not really good at dispoing or vice versa. So make yourself accessible to other people who are because it just loosens that stress. It takes away the thing that is making you not do the right. deal. Two, right. two things about that. First of all, I, I've spoken to people who said, come into my office and say, I've been a wholesaler for three years. And I'm like, how many, you know, what are you doing? And they're like, well, I've been building a buyer's list for three years. I'm like, that's not what you should be doing. That's right? a waste. That's a big waste of time. Yeah. Um, so, so that's true. But also when you partner with somebody who has a good list, who's wholesaling a lot, you're probably going to sell, you're probably going to make more money on it than you would if you just went out there and found a couple of people. So, Absolutely. so huge advantage is to partnering up with somebody who has a good, a good wholesale list for sure. Yeah. So Michael, before you actually were wholesaling, you were doing traditional flips. And what were you doing before you did flips? So I was in the mortgage business for 17 years. I worked for the same company from 1997 to 2013. Okay, gotcha. Oh, and then you said you were a stockbroker as well. No, so you had some yeah, sales uh, back. No, I was a stockbroker before that. I was a stockbroker in the 90s when I first got married. Then, so got I, was in, I worked for the same mortgage company that is still around uh, for 17 years. And while I was there, I was dabbling in flipping houses. I bought a couple here and there, held some, but uh, in 2013, I got out of the business and I knew that this is what I wanted to do full time. What do you think real estate's done for you in terms of your lifestyle? So the most important thing to me is time freedom. Like I, I, I see, I have, a lot, I, I have a lot of friends who are doctors, lawyers, investment bankers. They can't do what they want with their time, right? If a doctor isn't seeing patients, if a lawyer isn't billing, if a, if a investment banker is not in the office most of the time, um, he's they're not, they're not going to be able to make money. And some, I'm sure some of these guys make more money than I do, but but for me, the ability to to, to do what I want with my time, what is it? Do what what you want, when you want, with who you want. To me, that's so much more valuable. That's really the greatest thing. I remember you know, for 17 years, I worked for someone who. You know, when I wanted to take time off, I had to ask permission. He almost, almost so always said yes. Right. When I started working for myself and I'm like, I'm going to go and I don't have anybody to ask. It was like the greatest feeling in the world. And it still is. And I was able to, I have four children, two are, my oldest two are married. My youngest is turning 20. But really, um, the business has allowed me to, to spend a lot of time. I have two grandchildren now. Uh, they, they live in, on the other, wow. they live on the West Coast. I live in New York. They live in Los Angeles. And my wife and I see them, we try to see them every month. So either we're going there or they're coming to us. So the fact that I'm not going to miss them growing up, that I didn't miss my kids growing up um, is, a, is a huge thing. So to me, time freedom is more valuable yeah. than making more money. That's amazing. Yeah. What, what awesome Thank dedication you. that is to go visit once a month. I mean, that's a long plane ride. I, the, when, when the babies were born, the first baby was born, we went there for seven weeks. Right? We, awesome. We got, a, we got an Airbnb. I think that was right when the pandemic started and it was crazy in LA. Um, and when the second baby was born, he came a month early. We went there for four weeks and I, and I, I and it, we, he came a month early. So we were unprepared, but I commuted, I commuted pretty much every week. I'm okay with the commute. Like I go, yeah. went there for the weekends, come back here for four days. I can do it. 
it's not easy, but I, but I, it was okay. When you, when, yeah. when you were gone for seven weeks, who was answering the phone or meeting with sellers? So I have a team. Um, again, yeah. I have, uh, a few lead managers. I have a couple other VAs that do a lot of the things for me. Um, the only live U.S. person I have is my dispo manager because uh, we do take listings or we list properties, so she needs to be going to open houses and things. That's it. my only U.S. employee. And the rest of my team is all virtual in the Philippines or in Mexico. Gotcha. Cool. Well, congratulations on building a team and a business that lets you spend that kind of time with your family. That's awesome. Thank you. Especially unplanned, too. Yeah, it's mm. good. It's good. So, all right, for somebody who's listening that wants that, right? They're they're sick of having to ask off for their two-week vacation time they get per year at their job, but they haven't really done a deal yet, right? They're probably in analysis paralysis. What's your advice to them that you could leave them with, Michael? So, first of all, don't quit your job. Stay. You can, ah, you can do this part two times a day. Somebody said you, that. You can do this part-time for sure. One of my most successful students, um, worked for like big bank bank of america then wells fargo he had a job and he, he did this part-time pandemic helped because he was able to work virtually but um he just he's, he just gave notice that he's quitting his job now um after doing it for a couple of years but i think that that uh you should keep your job and work this part-time and i think uh it's very inexpensive to buy a list or get a list from a service like PropStream and skip trace a list you're talking about total investment of probably under a thousand dollars but that's a list that can last you nine months and to call is basically free you might want to spend money on a predictive dialer like a mojo or ready mode or call tools that's a hundred dollars a month so i would say when you start do not invest a lot of money into it um you're going to spend, spend time until you do some deals and then you can spend more money on all these things so that you're spending less time Love that. What, what's the list that you would suggest somebody pulls to start out? So it depends, right? If, if you can get code violation and tax delinquent lists and vacant lists and maybe stack those so you can see if though if, if someone's vacant and tax delinquent, that's I think that's a great list to mm. to uh, to market to. If you're in an area where I am where it's harder to get tax delinquent and those things, you can go with a broader list. So you can get a list from uh, from listability or a list from uh, even from PropStream, of uh, older people who lived in the house a very long time, uh, maybe have some equity. That's that's a broader list you can do. So it really depends on what what data you can get in your area. But the broader lists do work. Uh, the niche lists all work. You just need to you know you need to really spend the time to call them. It's not, you know, I, some of my students are like, well, all the numbers are wrong. I'm like, yeah, well, skip tracing is not an exact science. You took a list of took a list of 10,000 and you got 35,000 phone numbers. Most of them are going to be wrong. Like this is what people understand. Most of the numbers are going to be wrong. Most of the numbers that are right are people that are not going to want to sell their house. Most of the people who want to sell their house are probably not going to sell to an investor. And most people who sell to an investor may not even sell to you. So I tell people that on one list of 10,000 working it for six to nine months, you know, you don't know how many deals you're going to get. You should be getting leads that'll turn into deals later, but you, you know, you may not, you may not close that many deals when you start. Um, but it should get you at least one deal. Um, so that's really, the, that's the plan that I, that I teach my students, right? I keep, I try to keep their expectations though. Also in New York, the transaction takes so long. I didn't finish that story. So when I, when I switched from flipping properties to marketing direct to sellers, so I had a lot of advantages, right? I had money coming in from the flips I was selling. I, I knew real estate and it took me eight to nine months before I saw, before I got, got some money back, right? When I closed. Yeah, and you even knew what you were doing. Yeah, so it took a while because in New York, it takes a long time. It could, it could take a month or two to get into contract. A quick wholesale deal for me, a quick wholesale deal for me is two months, right? Quick wow. wholesale deal in most of the country is like two weeks. Two weeks, that's right. Right, yep. so New York takes a lot longer. So if you're operating in New York, you need to just have a longer time frame. But again, your, your yeah. rewards should be better. Like I said, that first deal, I made over $100,000. If you're operating in uh, Phoenix, Dallas, or uh, Vegas, you're probably not going to make hundred thousand dollars on your first deal. Right? If you make eight, right. if you make eight, you'll be happy. So eight thousand. You, right. you got to take the good with the bad. Love that. Where can people get in touch with you, Michael? So I have a what my website is called biggerflips.com. Okay. And uh, I'm available on all social media, Michael Pinter. There are other Michael Pinters, but if you put in Michael Pinter Real Estate or Michael Pinter New York, I'm probably the only one that's going to show up. Uh, awesome. So check out biggerflips.com or Michael Pincher on your favorite social media platform. Love it.
Thank you so much, Michael. It was great having you. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Deal Machine Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please leave us a review and follow along wherever you're listening to your podcast.